Hello everybody, Crit Crab here with another story, this one about the dangers of a weeb DM and what can only be described as a much subtler approach to the fairy tale DM. Almost as if the fairy tale DM wisened up and tried to make it harder for the players to tell that they were being railroaded. Of course, that failed hilariously. Roll post. We start around Christmas 2017. I've never really known anyone who's played D&D, but I've always wanted to play it for myself. As such, I tried to learn on my own, and I had to teach it to other people. I ran my first D&D game for my girlfriend, it was a one-on-one, -on -one, around Christmas, and it was pretty fun. It was so fun, in fact, that I tried playing a few more games, hoping one of my friends would become interested in replacing me as the de facto DM. But no such luck. For around half a year, I become the DM friend, and I start teaching my friends how to play D&D and run games for them. Life is good, but I still want to have an experience as a player, so around summer 2018, I decide to take a different approach. I go to a D&D Discord group. I'm in high school, so summer vacation gives me tons of time to find a group I like and play in a campaign consistently. For a few weeks, I mostly lurk around the Discord, stalking the GM Looking for Players channel. A bit intimidated by the seriousness of all the games advertised, as it is my first time as a player, I'm looking for a group of fellow newbies who won't mind if I make mistakes here or there. First mistake. Eventually, I find someone running a game that fits my needs. To keep him anonymous, let's call him Craig. He's looking for someone to join an ongoing campaign, someone who'd preferably experienced with roleplaying, as the other players seem a bit shy when it comes to roleplaying. Being that I'm a fairly outgoing person, and I already have experience with online roleplaying, I decide to hop right in. I message Craig, I ask him what type of character would fit the party best, and I eventually come up Rosu Warkiller, a hobgoblin artificer war princess. Rosu is going to end up being a blast, but that's a story for another thread. After turning in my character sheet, he invites me to the Discord group and tells me we're going to be playing on Saturday. I'm excited. I spend the entire week perfecting my character and the day eventually comes that we all hop into voice chat to play. I say hi and immediately I'm relieved. The three other people in the voice chat, being Craig and two other players, let's call them Dave and Keith, sound younger than I am. For reference, I was 17 at the time. And they all sound very shy and, well, nerdy. Being that I'm an outgoing charismatic person, I immediately start chatting with them. Craig, who I've never spoken to out of text until now, turns out to curse like a sailor. And I don't have a problem with cursing, but it seems that every sentence this guy says seems to have at least one F-bomb or a variation of it. But overall, he's alright. Dave is the second person who replies to me. He's a very serious person, and you can tell he's probably the eldest of the three. I ask him who his character is, and he tells me he's playing Icarus, a storm cleric who's trying to save his boyfriend Apollo or something. Yes. That Apollo. He worships Greek gods. The last person to say anything is Keith. He's a pretty funny but incredibly quiet, stereotypically nerdy guy. He's playing an optimized rogue ranger and half-elf named Adrian, and he seems to be more into the war game aspect of D&D. Whenever he roleplays, which is rarely, he does it in chat. I think because he's embarrassed to roleplay in front of his parents, given that he uses his living room computer. So we start playing. As I previously mentioned, I joined the campaign midway, meaning the players were already doing something. In this case, the session picks off with Adrian and Icarus on the verge of leading an army against the main bad guy's army to liberate some generic D&D town. They do so, painstakingly. Craig is insistent on using this weird army-on-army -army combat system he made up, and it is the most boring thing I have ever had to sit through. No role-playing, no characters doing anything, just an interaction more or less like this. Craig, your army is being attacked on three fronts and you have 900 soldiers. Where do you want to distribute your troops? Keith, after five minutes of silence. Uh, I guess 300 on each flank? Followed by, I kid you not, 30 minutes of pure rolling by the DM, with occasional updates on our army's HP, morale, and other arbitrary numbers that we won't care about. No one is into it, and you can tell... Dave is absolutely silent, hoping Keith will deal with the whole thing, and Keith goes AFK at one point because of how boring it is. I sit through the whole thing, still excited to begin with my character. Eventually, party and soldiers manage to liberate Genericville, and the party moves in to report to the Lord about their whole quest. But before this, they stop on by the Adventurer's Guild, go on a little side quest to recruit Rosu involving a battle tournament, and we end the session for the night. Not so bad so far. Right? Well, that was just an introduction. The story I'm about to tell happens a few sessions later. To bring you up to speed, the party moved from town to town piecing together clues on the big bad, and we deciphered that he was trying to construct the Dark Spire, 
a magical tower that could grant the Builder unlimited wishes. Our quest brings us to the edge of the continent, and we're told that the secret to defeating the Big Bad is held in a temple across the sea in a whole other continent. We recruit a few more players along the way, including a cat girl sorcerer named Nia. Wasn't actually called Nia, but I cannot for the life of me remember what she was called, and a tabaxi monk named Snow. We purchase a ship and travel across the sea. Eventually, we make it to the other continent, and Craig says, You guys see some fireworks as you approach the coastline. There's probably a festival happening today. Obviously a plot hook, but we decide to go with it. Rosu, who had been tinkering with making an animatronic Pegasus for Icarus, suggests to head into town to purchase a few supplies for her Pegasus, and also enjoy the festival. For a moment, I was hopeful that this session would be some fun, roleplay-heavy carnival hijinks. I was wrong. As we dock, the first thing we see is an old man. He stops us on the way to town and tells us about the festival. Today, every kid on the continent turned 13, and they get their grimoire, a source of magical power. Except Yami. Yami's a piece of crap. Immediately, I think two things. A. Does this mean every child on the continent is born at exactly the same time? B. Can this guy get any more obvious about his plot hooks? We tell him that's cool and all, but we need to buy supplies. The NPC tells us that we can't go into the festival because we're outsiders. We can't purchase supplies because the shops are closed, and the only thing we can do is go into the Orphanage slash Adventurers Guild. Yes, the Orphanage also serves as the Adventurers Guild, where Yami just so happens to be located. I roll my eyes, and we all just head inside the Orphanage. This is where it gets good, people. Once inside, the DM describes a child that looks exactly like the related pick. Black spiky hair, 13 years old, wearing jeans and a t-shirt. Yes, in D&D. And he seems to be moping around. The party heads over to him and asks him what's wrong. Yami tells us that he's the only child in the continent that can't use magic, and as such, he didn't receive his grimoire. The party kind of feels bad for him, so we all try and cheer him up, explaining how you don't need to use magic to be powerful. Each party member gives a frankly heartwarming account of how they rely on things that aren't magic. Snow says he's gotten strong and that's how he's powerful. Rosu says she's made incredible artifacts with science and research. And we all try and cheer him up. Yami stays silent for a few seconds. Yami. I still wish I had my grimoire. I'm useless. Okay, so our stories were shot down. The orphanage manager, who just happens to be the same old man we saw at the docks, asks us to go find his grimoire. The party has other plans. Rosu, being an incredibly motherly character and deciding that the kid is pretty cute, asks him if she can adopt him and gets rejected multiple times. Each time the old man just insists on us finding the grimoire. Eventually this gets pretty funny, so the whole party joins in on the insisting until the point when the DM loses it. He stays silent for a minute and then just asks us in an extremely exasperated voice if we can just agree to find the grimoire. No, we all say in unison. So he snaps and agrees to let us adopt Yami if we find the grimoire. We agree and Rosu immediately starts being a mama hen to Yami, telling him to stay on the boat with the animatronic servant she constructed and not get in the inevitable danger of combat. Reluctantly, Yami agrees and he stays on the ship. With that, we decide to go find the grimoire. Adrian activates a spell that'll help us know when the grimoire is close and we follow him out of the city, through the continent, in a trip that takes a number of days. After a brief time skip, we're less than five miles away from the grimoire, and we find a bandit camp nestled in a valley. It must be there. Excitedly, the party ducks behind a mountain, completely out of view of the bandits, who couldn't see us anyways, given that we were five miles away from them, and we start making battle plans. Up until that moment, the DM hadn't really given us any opportunities to sneak around, so we've all been waiting for this moment. Adrian decides to enchant our horse-sized dragon with major invisibility, and we all hop on the dragon, therefore making us invisible, given that the dragon is technically wearing us. Our planning goes on for a few minutes until the DM interrupts us, saying, You hear a voice coming from the bandit camp, saying, We can hear you, you know! We tell them to shut up and start making an attack plan instead. For some reason, they can hear us from five miles away, but we still have the upper ground. This goes on for a few minutes more until the DM interrupts us again by saying, Okay, the bandits snap their fingers and you're all teleported into their camp. 
That's fine. A bit bold that we don't get to do any saves against that, but it's fine. Each of us pull out our weapons ready to fight, but the bandit leader, who is described as a holographic being of pure magic, snaps his fingers again, and we're all wrapped in magical chains, immobilized. No problem, I'm an artificer, and I know Rosu as a magical item that can repair this. But as soon as I say that I reach for one of my tools, the DM tells me that I'm paralyzed from the waist down. Our monk tries to teleport out. He can't, because his monk powers don't work. Our rogue tries to lockpick the chains. There is no lock. It slowly dawns on us that this is something we can't fight, so we ask, is there anything we can do? No, says the DM. Alright, fine. By this point, we've been railroaded into a quest that makes no sense. We didn't even want to take it, and we're now paralyzed and teleported without a chance to fight back. We're all done with Craig at this point, so we just start asking the bandits to kill us, insulting them all the while. The bandits laugh and draw their weapons, monologuing on why they stole the grimoire and how they hate Yami. And then, Yami appears. Now think of it, Yami got past a combat-made golem and managed to follow us without supplies throughout the continent with no combat skills, magic, survival skills, or otherwise. This kid managed to follow us and avoid detection with only the clothes on his back. And now he's shown up at the best possible time, our very own Deus Ex Machina. But of course, given that he's unarmed and powerless, he can only manage to call out our names before one of the bandits smacks him to the ground. He begins to insult Yami, drawing a weapon, ready to execute the poor boy. He's helpless, beaten down, worthless. It's a true anime moment, isn't it? Of course it is. All at once, the party understands that the only way we're gonna get through this is through the power of God and anime on Yami's side. We all start cheering him on, and like if this were Dragon Ball yelling, You can do it, Yami! Despite all that, logically, he is very much dead, and after we encourage him enough, Craig says this. Yami struggles up, and a black sword materializes in his hand. The bandit says, The... N... This can't be... Yami raises his sword and yells out, Anti-Magic Pulse! The chains disappear, and he begins to cut down all of the magical bandits with his anti-magic sword. So Yami kills all the bandits, saves us all, saves his grimoire, and takes us back to the city. This entire session, we essentially did nothing. We arrived at a city and went on a pointless quest that could have been solved by an NPC, in where we contributed nothing. And that's where the story should end, shouldn't it? The campaign ended a few months ago. A few weeks ago, I was telling my friend this very story. He's a weeaboo, just like Craig, and the moment I describe Yami to him, he gets a strange glint in his eyes. He asks me to describe Yami to him, and I do. He asks me if he had a black sword, and I tell him he did. He asked me if he had a grimoire, and I told him he did. And that's the exact name the DM used for it. With a smile, my friend produces his phone and tells me to hold up while he Googles something. Then he shows me a wiki article for an anime called Black Clover, the protagonist of which is an anti-magic-using, sword-wielding, 16-year-old, spiky-haired anime kid whose picture looked exactly like the DM's description of Yami. So, TLDR, don't make your players feel useless in your plot. And if you are, don't rip off an anime doing it. And if you're gonna do those two things, can you at least make it so all this fits within the D&D universe? End post. Well guys, that was a true tale of anime friendship. If you want to have the power of God and anime on your side, please do slap that like and subscribe if you're new here. Till next time.